Good morning, everybody. We're going to go ahead and get started. We're here to recognize the best of the best of the first quarter of 2015. And to start it off, Chap. Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you for today. It's, uh, it's summertime, and uh, we know there's a new season. And we, we thank you for the men and women we're going to recognize who have uh, gone the extra mile to, uh, to do uh, an extraordinary uh, effort in the assignments that they've been called to. And Lord, as we pray, uh, I'm just mindful of a few things. Uh, as I was talking with the sheriff, we certainly send our thoughts and prayers out to the uh, city of Charleston, and particularly the AME Church, where uh, that horrific tragedy took place the other evening. Uh, we thank you for all the good that our deputies and staff do to give evil and hatred less and less space to land in our community. And we thank you for uh, watching over our officers that are on the road and out at the jail, and we pray uh, that you'll keep an eye on us as we uh, go into this storm season, and we thank you for your hands of protection and safety that are always with us, and we pray this prayer in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Chap. You know, the chaplain and I discussed this recent uh, event in Charleston, and uh, I'm singing to the choir here, but uh, law enforcement is really facing some great challenges. Uh, it seems like everyone you encounter uh, is armed with a gun. Uh, everyone you encounter has some form of mental illness, and you mix these two together, and it's a dangerous, dangerous combination for you to deal with. Uh, I'm sure as they investigate this incident in Charleston, they will find out that this young man had uh, mental illness for a long time. Uh, and last weekend in Dallas, a mentally ill uh, subject takes an armored van takes it to the Dallas Police Department, uh, unloads four pipe bomb bombs around the police department, then uh, proceeds to shoot the front door of the police department, then goes on a 13-mile chase. Uh, severely mentally ill individual that then blames police for the fact that he lost his son. So uh, you deal with all these factors in our community and uh, just continue to be safe because uh, this world is continuing to become more and more challenging for you. Uh, this uh, quarter's heroes, uh, first up is uh, Department of Administration, and Major Jerry Rockman will recognize the honoree. Major? Good morning. Everybody looks so excited to be here. <laughs> this is long, long overdue, and the civilian of the first quarter is Cindy Long. I was talking to Cindy yesterday and we were talking about this award and she goes this is the first time that she has ever received this <laughs> and if any of us who have been here so long always realize going back to when I was in patrol and if you were over in CID and of course in administration you've always if you needed something if you, if you weren't sure if you needed anything you'd always go and see Cindy and Cindy would be the one to, to help you out so I'm just shocked that it's taken this long and it's well overdue. Um, Cindy has been employed with the Sheriff's Office since 1985. During this quarter, she has been very instrumental in helping the office and the Sheriff and the Chief. I will just touch on a few examples. Earlier in the quarter, she assisted with the quarterly and annual awards. Cindy copied the certificates and award and the award write-ups for the <coughs> personnel files, placed the gold and seals and the ribbons on over 100 certificates, and then placed each certificate in the holder and presented it to the awards, presented at the awards, excuse me. This is very time consuming, and, and I actually remember seeing her working on those things, and uh, with a lot of patience, of course, too. In addition, Cindy volunteered to assist with the Sheriff's Office annual uh, golf tournament, and if you haven't seen uh, them working on it, it is, again, very time consuming to, to put a a golf tournament together, especially as one that involves so many things in our community. Uh, she was uh, started with way back in January. She took uh, on the role of keeping track of all the uh, donations. And just to give you an idea, it was 14 legal sized pages of, of all the things that she had to keep up with. So it was, again, very time consuming, very involved, very tedious. Uh, she was a tremendous help. Uh, before, during, and after the uh, tournament. 
Uh, throughout the year, you will see Cindy volunteer in the kitchen helping out with various luncheons. She assists with making uh, salad, warm, warming food, decorating the pavilion, and cleaning the pavilion. Uh, also to be noted is that uh, Cindy is also one of those people that steps up a lot of times in the, in the bad times when the funerals, or if we have some, a loss in the organization, who's, who's helping out in the office, you'll find Cindy. Uh, she does this in addition to her response within the Department of Administration. She never he hesitates to get involved or take a project, and I, I want to thank you for all you do, Cindy. So that's well appreciated. <laughs> Next up, the Department of Detention. Uh, Major Ty is not here. Uh, filling in is Captain William Longhorn. Captain. Good morning. So first up, I'd like to introduce the Detention Deputy of the First Quarter, Deputy Darian Spells. Come on up. So Mr. Spells was recognized by his sergeant and his peers on the night one ship. Deputy Spells is assigned to the B3 Special Management Unit, which houses the most acute mental health inmate population, and he experiences situations which many deputies do not. Deputy Spells has a keen understanding of what it takes to work in this environment. He's able to manage his emotions when confronted with some of the most confrontational and out of the ordinary behaviors. He's able to work with little supervision and takes the time to familiarize himself with the special management inmates to ensure they follow the rules and that he and his peers go home safely at the end of their shift. On the night shift, the jail does not have dedicated mental health staff to assist with issues that arise after hours. On several occasions, Deputy Spells has been able to calm the inmates down when they experience a personal crisis, and he assists with the medical staff in convincing inmates who are reluctant to take their meds to take them. Recently, Sergeant Hamilton witnessed Deputy Spells' professionalism uh, and reserve nature during two incidents. One involved an inmate spinning on him through the bars, and the second was when an inmate threw a tray of food on him. In both situations, Deputy Spells did not lose his composure and handled each situation professionally. He understands the many, that many, uh, many of the individuals he encounters in the mental health unit have behavioral problems that they simply cannot control and tend to act without warning. Every day he works in a stressful environment and con continues to display dedication and commitment to excellence. Mr. Spells, thank you for all you do. So next up, I'd like to introduce Sergeant Petri Hayes, Supervisor of the Quarter for the Department of Detention. <laughs> over the last 18 months, Sergeant Petri Hayes assumed command over the jail's emergency response team. While the jail has had an emergency response team for many years, Sergeant Hayes brought, it, brought to it a wealth of knowledge and experience from his past corrections experience in the, the state of Indiana. Late in 2014, Sergeant Hayes shared with me a vision for revitalizing the emergency response team and wanted to instill a higher level of excellence and professional standards that all response teams possess. In the first quarter of 2015, Sergeant Hayes brought his vision to light. He created a physical, training, physical fitness training program for all members and newcomers to possess or to pass in order to be considered for the team. In addition, he modeled the leadership he expects from the team and assigned reading assignments and writing assignments for all team members. The topic, leadership and group dynamics. He too participated in the assignment and required all members to read and write about what they learned. The assignments were then shared with each other. Accompanying this, Sergeant Hayes developed challenging trainings and empowered each of the members to specialize in tactical areas that appealed most to them. Each member received unique training in their area of specialization and are beginning to practice during monthly trainings. Aside from the leadership and team building, Sergeant Hayes spends much of his time planning tactical skill building lessons, ordering uniforms and equipment to ensure the team is ready for any emergency, and constantly pestering the Department of Detention's administration for as many training opportunities as he can get. <laughs> Finally, Sergeant Hayes manages a squad of 15 deputies on the day shift. Like the leadership skills exercised with the emergency response team, he demonstrates and encourages all of his squad members to be the best they can. In his spare time, he puts together basketball games for the St. Lucie Stars to play against other agencies around the Treasure Coast. As a side note, his team came in second place during the law enforcement, police, and fire games about a year ago. Sergeant Hayes, thank you for your leadership and your dedication to the Sheriff's Office. So 
next up is a combat injury award for Deputy Peter Redler. Peter, come on up. One of the major challenges in working in a correctional environment is not knowing what to expect around every corner. Inmates have 24 hours a day to plan their next move. On the morning of January 6th, Deputy Peter Redler was serving breakfast uh, when, without warning or provocation, he was attacked by a mentally ill inmate. Upon opening the dormitory door to start serving meals to the inmates, the inmate lunged through the doorway, attempting to strike Deputy Redler in the head. Deputy Redler was quick enough to avoid the strike and grab hold of the inmate, taking him to the ground. The two fell to the floor, where Deputy Redler landed on his right shoulder, dislocating it. Yet, without giving up, Deputy Redler continued to wrestle the, with the inmate on the ground. Uh, he, Deputy Redler indicated he did not realize his shoulder had been injured. He described the inmate choking him and realized he was in great danger. Skillfully, he was able to free himself from the inmate's chokehold and gain a dominant position, physically restraining the inmate on the ground until assistance arrived. He accomplished this with only one good arm. The inmate planned the attack, knowing the exact timing to try to get the biggest impact. It was later determined that the attack was not specifically intended for Deputy Redler, but for any staff member. Deputy Redler just happened to be that staff member representative. Congratulations on an outstanding job, considering the obstacles you endured. Next up is a life-saving award. I'm going to read off several names. Uh, Deputy Matthew Isles, Deputy Stephen Paceres, Nurse Levi Barker, Nurse Danielle Carbone. Got the nurses here. Yeah. Nurse Amanda Emerson. Nope. Nurse Susan Maza. And Nurse Diane Umbach. So on the morning of January 26th, the detention staff passed out shaving razors to the inmates in B1 housing as required by state hygiene standards. After delivering the razors to the inmates in Dorm 4 and while working in the remaining units, the inmates in Dorm 4 began causing a commotion to alert deputies that an inmate was attempting suicide. Deputy Matthew Isles heard the commotion and immediately responded to the scene. He radioed for assistance, alerting security and medical staff to the suicide attempt. The inmate in question had cut both his arms just below the elbow and was ble bleeding profusely, covering the cell with large amounts of blood. Deputy Stephen Paceres was the next deputy on scene, and he and Deputy Isles immediately began to make the scene safe, attempting to locate the razor. Nurses Susan Maza and Diana Umbach were the first medical staff to respond and quickly began to assess the suicidal inmate. EMS was alerted via 911. While waiting for EMS, Deputies Paceres and Isles had to remove the inmate from the cell due to the, due to the small space and the large amount of blood covering the floor. Nurses Levi Barker, Amanda Amerson, and Diana, or Di Danielle Carbone arrived on scene and all made efforts to stop the bleeding by applying pr pressure to the wounds. Several attempts were made to start an IV but failed due to the inmate's extreme blood loss. Deputy Paceres elevated the inmate's leg to prevent him from going into shock. All staff on scene maintained their efforts until EMS arrived and took over rescue efforts. In the end, the inmate was transported to Lawnwood Medical Center and recovered from a suicide attempt. These deputies and nurses displayed professionalism and quick thinking in response to a traumatic event. Many other staff responded and assisted in securing the razor used to, in the suicide attempt, providing towels and supplies for the rescued effort, and in calming the other inmates in the dorm. I'd like to take a moment just to acknowledge everybody who responded, yet did not receive the award. Sergeant Lynn Esposito-Knight, Deputy Robert Wise, Deputy Santi Briglia, Deputy Richard Young, Deputy Ronnie Jenkins, Deputy Shazam Hussein, and Deputy Anthony Ballone. To all of them, great job. Now we have the Distinguished Service Award. Uh, let me have Sergeant Patrick Bashan, <laughs> Deputy Tracy Hanksler, Deputy Cesar Miat, Fabian Cesar, I messed up that name, Deputy Jason Paquette, see here. Deputy Pinckney, and Nurse Diane Coleman. So the booking center is one of the most vital components of the Department of Detention. On average, it takes about three hours to process an individual all the way through. With legal guidelines, uh, 
uh, to process an individual in under six hours, the booking staff find themselves challenged from time to time. On March 17th, night one booking reported for duty with over 30 inmates to be processed, plus eight added charges needed to be completed. Patrick Sergeant Bashan immediately made assignment changes, and these deputies and nurses handled the following. 41 inmates booked, plus eight additional charges, 18 inmates released, starting headcount with 30, ending with only eight. Three strip searches, three additional reports were generated in relation to these searches, plus no use of force or major mistakes during the night. Based on the average information, they processed about 5.5 inmates per hour. This doesn't include phone calls, teletypes, or new inmates coming in. Thank you all for a job well done. And last but not least, this is a unit citation for the Operation Gang Intelligence Track. So Sergeant Petrie Hayes, Sergeant Hamilton, Deputy Angulo, Deputy Braden, Deputy Saccone, Deputy Doty, Deputy Henrich, Deputy Hocker, Deputy Holshauser, Deputy Jones, Deputy Keefe, Deputy Knudsen, Deputy Lamb, Deputy Letman, Deputy Lopez, Deputy Mangle, Deputy McClellan, Deputy Perkins, Deputy Phillips, Deputy Rodriguez, Deputy Spells, Deputy Streeter, Detective Archie, Detective Pearson, Detective Mike. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. I have the pleasure of introducing the recipients of the law enforcement department. First up, deputy of the first quarter, David Caglioni. Dave. <laughs> At the time that this was submitted, Dave was assigned to the patrol one day shift. He is a leader among his peers. He has been the team leader for various traffic and crime prevention operations. While running radar during one of the traffic operations, one resident made a poster with the words, great job. Others pulled out their lawn chairs to watch them run radar in their neighborhood, which is pretty nice when you got a following. Deputy Caglione maintains his CDL license, which comes in very handy for the office. He moves a lot of our uh, big trucks and heavy equipment around when needed to emergency scenes and the like. In addition, he assists the SWAT team with the movement of their armored personnel carrier as well as the command bus. During this quarter, Dave relocated our bait trailer on numerous occasions to different sites to warn the public about traffic hazards and, and uh, their speed infractions. Deputy Caglione is an FTO and teaches newly hired deputies uh, how to do the job as well as OSSI report writing. His proficiency with the program makes him a valuable asset to his squad and the agency. David, thank you very much for your work. <laughs> now
Next up, Sergeant James Defonso. She brought your cheering section with you, Jim. Yeah. That's, that's very admirable. I, I prepaid for that. That's good. Sergeant Jim Defonso has worked for the Sheriff's Office for 21 years. Sergeant Defonso is the agency's lead armorer. He maintains the 700 plus weapons that the agency owns and issues to deputies. Maintaining these weapons means that Sergeant Defonso must replace broken parts and upgrade weapons as needed for all agency firearms. Currently, he is working on converting approximately 200 military rifles for law enforcement use and deployment to the agency personal, personnel, as well as upgrading all 225 agency shotguns, plus the 75 issued less than lethal, lethal shotguns. This is all in addition to his numer, normal duties as supervisor. He is one of two supervisors in charge of our narcotics unit. He continues to motivate and train the new detectives while ensuring productivity and safety. James, thank you for a job well done. <laughs> Next up, an exceptional duty award for Detective Ronnie Wentz. On June 22nd, 2014, Detective Wentz responded to Northern Fort Pierce in reference to a vehicle arson. He contacted the owner of the vehicle who told him that Bridget Music should be driving the vehicle. Detective Wentz spoke to several of Bridget's family members who stated it was uncharacteristic for Bridget not to answer her phone. After numerous failed attempts to contact Bridget, a missing persons bolo was issued. The family suspected that her ex-husband, Jacob Music, in her disappearance and arson of her vehicle. During these interviews, one of the family members received a telephone call from Jacob, was at a family member's house holding Bridget's necklace with bloodstains. Jacob said the drug dealer from Gifford admitted to killing Bridget and threatening to kill him and his current girlfriend. The family said they suspected Jacob of killing Bridget because of past domestic issues. Detective Wentz interviewed the suspect drug dealer. This suspect had several witnesses that proved that he was not in fact responsible for, for Bridget's disappearance. However, he was actively dealing drugs. On June 23rd of 2014, Bridget's music's body was discovered in a canal in northern, northwest Fort Pierce. It was apparent that Bridget Music was the victim of a homicide. Detective Wentz received information that Jacob Music was hiding in a hotel with his current girlfriend Surveillance was set up at the hotel, and within 30 minutes, Jacob was taken into custody. On December 16, 2014, the grand jury indicted Jacob Music on the first-degree murder for the death of Bridget Music. On February 3, 2015, Jacob Music was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. This was a huge accomplishment for Detective Wentz to make the case this strong to have it go to trial in less than eight months. Ronnie, thank you very much for a job well done. We have a unit citation for the gang unit, Sergeant Steve Sessoms, Detective Michelle Hernandez, Detective Drew Sosby, and Detective Troy Norman. <laughs> hey, how you doing? The gang unit was created a year ago. They are responsible for identifying and documenting all suspected gang members in the county. Since the, officer never, since the office never had a full-time gang unit, much work had to be done in setting up the operation. They developed goals and objectives for the unit. Detectives Hernandez and Sosby reviewed the information in the gang track system, which had not been updated since the switch to our current OSSI report system. Detective Hernandez went through the gang field interview cards and entered information into the gang database. During the quarter, they worked with the St. Lucie County Fair. The first night of the fair, they found known gang members walking around. They set up surveillance and continued to follow them until they left the fair. On March 12th, they participated in Operation GI Track at the jail, which was already recognized. Over 100 field interview cards were developed out of that operation. Suspect gang members were collected and entered into the system. During a Housing Authority presentation, presentation, Detective Norman outlined several arrests he made on Housing Authority property. One was for a fraud case of a resident 
who was living on the property for free and receiving 39 a month towards her power bill. This resident then moved out and some leased the property to a third party for $400 a month. After his presentation, the Housing Authority Director extended their contract with the office for another year. Thanks for all you do for the gang unit. <laughs> Next up, a unit citation for the traffic unit. Sergeant Brian Rhodes, Sergeant, uh, uh, Deputy Dave Felix, Deputy Chris Gordonier, Deputy Brett Hamlin, Deputy Tim Parlett, Deputy Greg Hayford, Deputy Todd Hogan, Deputy Dave Snow, and Michelle Nesman. Take your time getting up here. Uh, they must be. A lot going on. I'll read this real quick since we announced everybody. The traffic unit is responsible for nine crossing guards, 13 parking enforcement volunteers, the speed awareness trailers, the informational traffic display signs, oversight of the intoxilizers, traffic complaints, traffic crashes, DUI enforcement operations. In addition, they handle funeral escorts throughout the county, presidential motorcades, parades, and holiday uh, events. During the first quarter, there were 4,488 agency traffic contacts. The traffic unit handled 2,507 of those contacts, which was 55.86%. In addition, they worked 269 crashes and arrested 68 people for DUIs. All citations, traffic crashes, and other data is manually entered into our computer system. It is tracked and sent to the appropriate outside agencies such as the clerk's office, the high, Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicle, and DUI Administrative Hearing Office. This work is all completed by Michelle Nesmith, who is the uh, office manager for the traffic unit. It is also the above reason why all these members are recognized for their work. Thank you very much. Can we find out where they are? Sergeant Butchko, is he here? Yeah. Come on up front. Sergeant Butchko was our last year Detention Supervisor of the Year Award. And, and I presented this to him at the, the jail, and sadly we didn't take a picture, so I'm going to take a picture at this time. Again, uh, my day usually starts off with a, a either phone call or uh, at noon when we pick up the mail with uh, comments from our citizenry. I have two that I want to share with you uh, this morning. And uh, again, you know, in my opinion, putting bad guys uh, away in jail is really easy. Uh, the hardest part is when you go out there and uh, make a change in someone's life and influence someone to the extent that they actually either write a letter or call me and tell me about the experience. Uh, the first one, Sheriff Mascara. My name is Dr. Colette St. Andre, and I work for the Public Defender's Office. Please allow me this opportunity to thank two of your deputies that assisted my family in a terrible time of need. The deputies are Jeff Serafini and John Wise, who answered a 9-11 call to my father's home on February 14, 2015. My father had a medical emergency that required immediate hospitalization. He was found on the floor and unresponsive. I was informed later by the emergency room physician that had he remained unattended, he no longer would, or he would have died. My father's wife, who has now been treated for early stages of dementia, could not give any information to the deputies and was acting very confused. She did not even remember calling 911, nor could she answer simple questions. The deputies were able to find my cell phone number and also saw a number for the St. Lucie County Jail on the refrigerator of the home and called me. 
When I arrived, the deputies were waiting for me to express their concern about my stepmother and my father. Both Deputy Serafini and Deputy Wise were so compassionate and insightful to accurately assess the situation and stay with my stepmother until I arrived. The end result is that my father is out of ICU and in rehabilitation, soon to be returning home, and his wife is receiving the medic medical attention for her, her illness that was not apparent until this incident. That night, two people's lives were saved. I am very grateful to both Deputy Serafini and Deputy Wise. Great letter, huh? <laughs> the next one is from the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office. Dear Sheriff Mascara, I want to take this opportunity to thank you and your agency's partnership in Operation Magic Carpet. This operation targeted Urban Wear, a business located in Riviera Beach, a front for a large fencing operation that spans several counties from Broward County all the way to Indian River County. Stolen electronics, jewelry, and firearms were being sold to gang members. Several agencies assisted in the planning and execution that included the FBI, ATF, the State Attorney's Office of Palm Beach, and St. Lucie County. The conclusion of this operation yielded cash, drugs, handguns, high-powered rifles, ammunition, jewelry, and other items. The two main targets were arrested along with 11 others. With the assistance of your special investigation detectives, we were able to infiltrate the organization and over a space of four months were able to secure enough evidence for the procurement and execution of four search warrants. This operation would not have been possible without the additional assistance from your agency of Sergeant Rob Pettit, Sergeant Jim DeFonso, and Lieutenant Brian Hester. It was a pleasure working with these professional law enforcement officers, and if there is ever anything I or the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office may do to assist your agency, please do not hesitate to call respectfully Major Frank DeMario, Palm Beach Sheriff's Office. <laughs> Again, you got a tough job. Uh, you are heroes every day. Uh, keep up the good work and be safe. God bless you all.